Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunto-jesus.net. Hello, we're glad you're listening to our program today. My name is Tom Rainwater, and we have with us William Stewart, who is a regular guest on our program. Glad to have you here, William. Glad to be here, Tom. The question we're going to ask today is this. Is homosexuality a sin? Many people have varying opinions on this topic. Some think homosexuality is an acceptable lifestyle and thus blessed by God. Others think homosexuality is a sin and thus condemned by God. And still others are indifferent and have no real conviction on this topic. So what we're going to do on the program today is ask the question that we always ask, what does the Bible say? And so... What does the Bible say about this? Is homosexuality a sin? Well, Tom, it might do us good to go back to Genesis in the second chapter when God created man, and we'll see how God created him and the relationship that God developed for man. In Genesis 2, and beginning at verse 21, we read, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God's plan from the very beginning was for a man and a woman to join together, to be a unit, to become one. We've perhaps heard people say that God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And that's what we see in this text, that a woman was the only suitable helpmeet for man. I think Jesus reinforces this fact in Matthew chapter 19 in talking to the Jews, and really the subject there was that of divorce. But Jesus said in Matthew 19 and verse 4, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And so we see this, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, that God made man and woman at the beginning. That the relationship there is between a male and a female. Also, we might consider 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, beginning at verse 2. We read, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Again, we have the scriptures showing us the relationship that God had planned and devised for man, that of let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. There's no mention of a man with a man or a woman with a woman that has the approval of God. But yet these things are written by the Apostle Paul and with God's approval that each man ought to have his own wife and each woman ought to have her own husband and render to one another the affection that is due to the other. Yes, and speaking about the sexual relationship between a husband and wife, that certainly is a blessing from God. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And so God gave us the marriage relationship, that there would be one husband and one wife. And that's God's pattern for us. He created man and woman for one another. And so homosexuality is a perversion of God's creation. Woman is the only suitable helpmeet for man. She was made for him. If we go to Romans chapter 1, verse 26... The Apostle Paul is talking about the Gentiles of ages past who ceased following God. Instead, they followed their own lusts. In Romans 1, verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, 
leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And so there in that verse we see plainly the homosexual relationship described as being sinful, that people left God's way, they started following their own lusts, and thus they were condemned. Other sins are also listed within that context when you look in verses 28 down through 31. And clearly these all together are condemned by God. Tom, some of the things that we might want to emphasize from Romans chapter 1. In verse 26, notice it says that they exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. For women to be with women is against nature. It's not what God devised. It's not God's plan. We go further in verse 27, and speaking about the men who left the natural use of the woman, it says they burned in their lust for one another. He's saying this is a burning lust. This is something that is sinful. And he goes on to say that they committed what is shameful. These things ought to cause one to blush and to acknowledge that it's sinful and it's not according to the pattern of God. In Jude, in verse 7, we have a reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities that are mentioned to us in detail in Genesis chapter 19. And we read in Jude 7 that as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. These things that we read of in Jude 7 are in reference to Genesis chapter 18 and chapter 19. If we go back to chapter 18 and verse 20, we read, And the Lord said, Because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, And because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah was on account of their homosexuality. It was on their sexual misconduct. And we find in this context of Genesis chapter 18 that Abraham pleaded with the Lord concerning the city. Of course, he had relatives there, Lot and his family. And when we get to the end, we find that there's not so many as ten righteous individuals in that city. Yes, William, and when we get into chapter 19, we see the conduct of their homosexuality. And so two angels came to Lot in the form of men in the city of Sodom. In Genesis 19 and verse 4, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called the lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. And so Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. In verse 9, And they said, Stand back. Then they said, This one came into sojourn and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Now the men in this city are obviously homosexual. And they seek to have sexual relations with the angels who were there visiting with Lot, and the angels, as we said, were in the form of men. And so they threatened to break down the door. They threatened to take them by force, as well as Lot. And in verse 4, the lust wasn't limited to any age. It was both old and young. And it wasn't limited to any social status, because these people came from every quarter of the city. And in their lust, they were determined to fulfill them. The homosexuality of these men and their strong desires for one another is exactly the reason why the Lord destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the latter part of chapter 19. In Peter's second epistle, he talks about this event. In 2 Peter 2, in verse 6, it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, 
making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. We need to understand that this example that God made of Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for the ages. It's supposed to tell us that we're not to live that way. We're not to act that way. We're not to follow after homosexuality and its lusts. Otherwise, we're going to be doomed. We're going to be condemned. Sodom and Gomorrah were before the coming of the Law of Moses. But when we look into the Law of Moses, which God gave to Israel, we find that God's plan did not change, that homosexuality was still considered to be a sin, and uh, that it was abominable before the Lord. In Leviticus, in chapter 18, at verse 22, we read, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. In chapter 20, and verse 13 of the book of Leviticus, chapter 20 and verse 13, we read, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. It's clear that the Lord's will is that man should not lie with man, and, and equally that woman should not lie with woman. The Lord finds these things to be abominable. These things are detestable and, and perverse in his sight. So not only do we see homosexuality condemned in God's punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah and in his law to the Israelites and the law of Moses, it's also condemned in Christ's law. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And so there the passage is quite plain. No homosexual or sodomite will inherit the kingdom of God if they continue in their sin. But the great thing about this passage is what it says in verse 11. Because there were those in Corinth who had been guilty of homosexuality, but they had been forgiven of their sin in Christ and were able to change their behavior. Because he says in verse 11, And such were some of you. You were this way in the past. In other words, you've made the change in your life. And here's how they had gotten rid of their sins. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so if we want to become Christians today, we've got to follow that as well. We've got to repent of our sins and have our sins washed away in obedience to Christ. Tom, we might also look at 1 Timothy in chapter 1, and beginning at verse 8, we read, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. A few things that we might want to note from this text. First, he says that the law is not made for a righteous person. The law is given, the law of Christ is given to us in order to bring us out of sin. He didn't come to save those who are already righteous. He came to save sinners. And notice in the list of sins that he gives to us, he mentions those who are sodomites. And, of course, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah just a few moments ago. He says the law is intended for these people in order to call them out, as was seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice, he says, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, there are some today who will try to tell us that God is happy with those who are homosexual, that it's not a problem before him. The Apostle Paul considered it to be contrary to sound doctrine. 
It was a corrupt idea to think that one could be homosexual and please God at the same time. It's contrary to what God's Word says. It's contrary to the glorious gospel that he speaks about in verse 11, which was given by God and committed to the trust of the Apostle Paul and those who would uplift God's Word. And so I believe we've established clearly through the Scriptures that homosexuality is a sin and it is condemned by God and people are expected to repent of that sin and find salvation in Jesus Christ. Well, there are some people who say, now wait a minute, I was born this way. This is the way that I was made. I was made a homosexual. I can't help it if I'm different. So let's address that. Are people born homosexual? Well, what I think we need to do is we need to distinguish between those characteristics of man that are inherited and those things which are learned. There are certain desires that man has been given by God that are natural. There are other desires that man has that are learned or cultivated in time. For instance, man has been given the desire to eat. Our hunger for food is that which is natural. It's part of our self-survival. Now, someone in time may start craving a Big Mac and fries. I've known people that every time they get hungry, they're desiring McDonald's or something like that. They've developed a craving for a Big Mac and fries over time. There was a friend of mine in Arkansas who, every Friday, he had a desire to eat sushi. To me, that's something you would have to cultivate. I certainly have no desire for that, and I believe that's something that is cultivated. We, we desire certain types of food over time. So you see the difference. We have a natural desire to eat, but in time we learn and cultivate a desire for certain things. Not only do we have a desire to eat, but we also have a desire to drink. It's necessary. We need to drink liquid to sustain our lives. Yet in time, we cultivate desires for certain types of drinks. A person may be hooked on Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Others might desire a beer or something of that nature. These things are cultivated or learned. Now, we understand through the scriptures that drunkenness is a sin. And so those who have developed a desire for beer need to curtail that desire. As they have learned to have a desire, they can also learn not to have it. Also, as humans, we have a desire to communicate with one another. We all have a language that we speak. We're not born speaking a language. A child is not born speaking Chinese or born speaking Spanish or English. He learns that over time. People also learn profanity over time. They've learned it from hearing it from other people. They develop the habit, and it's a habit that we need to break. Because speaking profane and dirty words are against God and his law. Now, this same principle holds true with the sexual desire. God has given each one of us a sexual desire. And he has given us this desire, which is naturally fulfilled in marriage between a man and his wife. There are a lot of people who do not control their sexual desire. There are some men who desire more women than just their wife. They need to control that. That's wrong. People have learned perverted sexual desire. There are men who desire other men sexually or women who desire other women sexually. That is wrong. It is a perversion. It's something that is learned. It's imitated. It's cultivated. Homosexuality is not a natural desire that God has given us. It wouldn't make sense if God condemned homosexuality but made certain people that way. When it comes to sin... Sin is not inherited. It is not genetic. Sin, any sin and all sin, is that which is learned, that which is imitated, and that from which we need to turn. To further emphasize that point that we learn sin, in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and at verse 9, the Lord speaking with Israel says, When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. He tells them, you're not to learn these things. You're not to imitate them in what they've done. And again in verse 14, he says, For these nations which you will dispose listened to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Notice the nations themselves that he says, you're not to imitate them or you're not to learn from them. He says, they themselves have listened, or they have learned, they have imitated or followed the soothsayers and the diviners. 
But the Lord says to Israel, God has not appointed such for you. You're not to learn these things. You're not to cultivate their sins into your lives and into your ways. Another passage that says nearly the same thing is in Psalm 106. Psalm 106, beginning in verse 34 and going through verse 39, where the psalmist speaks about the sins of the Israelites and the fact that they had not destroyed the Canaanites, but rather learned from them. In verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus, they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. And so their immorality, their sin, was not something that they were born with, It was something that they had learned from the Gentiles. It was their own works, their own actions, their own habits that condemned them. Likewise, in Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, and beginning at verse 24, we read, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. When it comes to our tempers or when it comes to to getting angry, some will like to say that they were born that way and some will blame it on their red hair or whatever it might be. The Lord says, make no friendship with this angry man. He says, lest you learn his ways. Reminds me of something the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter, verse 33. Evil company corrupts good habits. We need to be careful of the company we keep because we learn from the company that we keep. Ultimately, all sin, whether it's the sin of of drunkenness or profanity or out-of-control anger or homosexuality, we learn it from the devil. The devil is the source of all sin. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, John 8, 44, Jesus addresses some of the sinful Jews of that time. And he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so all sin comes from doing what the devil wants us to do. The devil is always in opposition to God in God's ways. The devil would have us pervert our lives and go in opposition to God, but it always leads to destruction. Let's not follow the devil and his temptations or follow those who have already succumbed to the devil's temptations. There are many people today who say that homosexuality is a good thing and that those who would oppose such activity, they're the ones that are bad. That the ones who speak against the sin of homosexuality are bigots and homophobes and so forth. Well, that sort of attitude is very similar to what was going on in Israel at the time of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, there are a lot of people today who want to call bad things good, and when you try and do good, they call you bad. And, of course, when Jesus was on this earth and trying to do good, there were many people who called him different names. Certainly, if we take a stand for the truth, there'll be those who speak against us. But it seems more and more today there are people who are not willing to take a stand on this issue. There are a lot of denominations today, such as the Lutheran Church and the Methodist Church and others, who will not condemn homosexuality as a sin. There are many of these denominations who are considering allowing some of their so-called clergy to be homosexual. And this is all in contradiction to God's word. God says that it's wrong, therefore we need to say that it's wrong. In Second John, in verse 9, we read, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You know, William, one of the things that we need to bring out here at the end of the program is that though we are to oppose the sin of homosexuality, 
we are to love homosexuals. That is, we are to show concern for them. We're not to hate them because they practice the sin. We hate the sin because of what it's doing to them, that their soul is condemned in their sin, and we want to see them saved. We want them to become Christians and to be saved by Jesus Christ. We're not to hate anybody. In John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world. He didn't love the sin, but he loved the people, so much so that he sent Jesus Christ to die for their sins. Now, we need to teach people about Jesus so that they can believe in him and obey him and thus be saved. Jesus. 